Here at Penn State University, I've designed a course that's all about debunking the myths of autism. I find that even our senior psychology students hold pervasive myths about autism. And I'm here today to debunk two of those myths and to also teach you about some of the cutting-edge science that will help you think very differently about autism. The first myth is that vaccines have nothing to do with autism. And people come to me and they say, but we just don't have the science that really lets us know for sure that that's the case. And in fact, I'm going to show you in a very simple graphic that that's just not true. We have population studies from North America, from Europe, from Asia, that in fact show with over a million children that vaccines have nothing to do with autism. And the, the concern was that the culprit was the MMR vaccine. And this vaccine is given to children long after their first birthday. But we now know that the early signs of autism show up within the first six to nine months of life. Babies who go on to develop a diagnosis of autism don't have social emotional connections with their caregivers in these early months of life. They don't look in their faces, they don't stare in their eyes. If you've had a baby, you know that those early days, you just lock eyes with your baby and you spend hours and hours staring into their face. And this is the time when we learn about being people. We learn about how we communicate with faces. We learn how to recognize each other with our faces. We learn how to read expressions with our faces. Well, people with autism never clue into that. They're never good at recognizing faces. They're never good at recognizing emotions. And this deprives them of the opportunity to really clue into core elements of social communication. And it's not just behavioral indices that we can spot in these early months of life, but actually brain development is already on atypical trajectory in these early months of life. Typically developing children show nice linear improvements in the size, the nice linear uh, increases in the size of their cortex from six to nine months of life up until they're two years of age. Children with autism start off with bigger brains and they grow faster over the course of these first two years of life. And this actually sets them up in bad ways. It sets them up for atypical trajectories, not only in infancy, but for childhood and adolescence and later on in adulthood. And this leads me to the second myth about autism, which is that it's not just a disorder of childhood. People forget that kids with autism grow up to be teenagers with autism, and adults with autism, and seniors with autism. And it is true that the core symptoms of autism are most severe for many people in childhood. And so these symptoms are things like uh, repetitive behaviors. You see kids self-stimming a lot in childhood, and that can uh, decrease over time in adolescence and adulthood. And you see the restricted interest and in the extreme focus on objects that can sort of be ameliorated a bit over time with adolescent, in the transition from adolescence and adulthood. But you need to know that there are other symptoms that actually increase in this very time, in the transition from adolescence to adulthood. So for example, people with autism report feeling a sharp increase in a sense of loneliness in the transition into adolescence. That increases as they become young adults. And they also start feeling a sense of wanting to withdraw more socially. So while their core symptoms might be improving, over the course of adolescence and adulthood, they start becoming more lonely and socially isolated. And this is a problem because we also start seeing an increase in concurrent diagnoses. We start seeing more depression and more anxiety and more sleep problems. In my lab, we're working very hard to try to understand what is going on in their brains at this time. And I study this social information processing, the brain networks that are really important in helping us know faces and understand faces and recognize facial expressions. And what we see is that these brain networks are weak, they're not well connected, 
And all of this evidence is suggesting to us and converging on a strong claim. And this is what I'm here to tell you, that adolescence is a vulnerable period of time for people with autism. I want you to think about that. This is a new way of thinking about autism. And in order to really understand the consequences of this, you have to remember what it's like to be a typically developing adolescent. Think about what you're doing at that time. You are learning a whole host of brand new, very nuanced social skills. You are immersed in your peer friendships, right? You're starting to date. You're thinking about peers as romantic and sexual partners for the very first time. You had no frame of reference for this as children. Right? You're learning how to flirt. You're learning how to be rejected. You're also interested in becoming autonomous as from your parents. You're learning how to do things like drive. But in order to do this, you've got to learn how to manage your own behavior. You've got to be able to keep focused on the task at hand, even when there's a whole lot of other emotional stuff going on. When you have a backseat full of teenagers screaming at you, you've got to stay focused on the job at hand and not run yourself off the road. And we know that your ability to accomplish these tasks in adolescence and acquire these very nuanced social skills as a typically developing adolescence sets you up as a young adult. It really helps you learn the skills that are essential for becoming an independent adult. Unfortunately, typically adolescents with autism are not able to learn these skills on their own. And there are sad, unfortunate consequences. If you ask adults with autism if they've ever dated, 44% report that they've never dated, never dated. And it's not because they don't want to. They don't choose to live in a social bubble. Of the people who are trying to date, they have no idea what they're doing. They're directing their attempts at strangers, not at people that they know, who they might have a chance with, and the behaviors that they're using are inappropriate, and sometimes they get accused of stalking. And there are some unfortunate missed opportunities. So only 19% of adults with autism are working, but 74% say they'd like to be working. And there are, some, there are some success stories, and I'll give you an example of one, but there are a very constrained set of circumstances under which people with autism are successful in work, in work situations. So there's a young man that I worked with at Pittsburgh who had a very high IQ, super high IQ, and we were able to help him get a job. This job is sorting documents. People with autism are really good at following a procedure and following a routine, and he could do this so accurately and so consistently and so regularly. But his boss said, you know, I appreciate that you can do this as well as you can, but I, I just need you to do this faster. And he said, well, I, I don't know how to be faster. He said, well, I need you to figure it out, just be faster. And he says, but I, I can't do that cannot figure out a strategy on his own to be faster. Well, fortunately for him, his medical doctor and the employer worked together to devise a strategy and explicitly teach him how to be faster. Well, to this day, he's had this job for many years because he had an understanding employer who was willing to work with him and teach him a strategy and let him do this one thing over and over and over and over and over and over again like a machine every single day. And that's the context in which he can be successful, as an adult with autism, working. So this is what makes autism so different than all other developmental disorders. People with Down syndrome, who can be much more intellectually compromised than many people with autism, do a whole lot better maintaining a job, finding romantic partners, even having families. Autism makes it really difficult to become an independently functioning adult. I want to, and this makes it really, really difficult for their families. I want to introduce one of my favorite families to you. I've been working with them for several years. These are the Duncans. Both of their boys have a diagnosis of autism, and their story really illustrates how difficult it is to be a family with autism. Dylan and Kylan both have autism, it's not easy to get an appropriate diagnosis of autism. It took this family years, years, 
Both boys were misdiagnosed multiple times with other kinds of disorders. You don't just go to your family GP and get a diagnosis of autism. You have to be referred to a specialist who can do an extensive, hours-long behavioral interview to get the diagnosis. And there aren't that many people who know how to do this. It took them years to do this. Dad had to leave a job in the service with a huge um, pension plan to be able to come home and help support his family, to be able to provide the support for working with the boys. Uh, grandma moved in with the family to be able to help them. The boys are actually doing okay. Before 2012, the state of Pennsylvania did not require that health insurance provides um, services, pay for services for individuals with autism. The family needed a service dog for their youngest son. They, had no, they, had not, they didn't have enough money. They crowdsourced. They went on a crowdfunding webpage. They got money this way to get a service dog for their son, Gabe. These boys are becoming adolescents. Their needs are going to change. They're going to become young men. By 25, they're going to age out of the vast majority of all services available to people with autism in all states. And the burden of their care is going to be with their family. And as I've said, autism is a disorder that makes becoming an independent adult incredibly difficult. So I want to conclude by showing you this billboard that is now in Times Square. Children with autism become teenagers, adults, and seniors with autism. And I want to leave you with two thoughts. As the science teaches us more and more about the vulnerabilities of adolescents with autism, it's our job to help teachers and doctors and policymakers understand these vulnerabilities. And number two, Although I've told you a cautionary tale about how adolescence is a vulnerable developmental period for people with autism, I also want you to think about how it might be a time of opportunity, a time when we can target specific skills and help train people with autism to learn the social skills that are so essential for reaching independence in adulthood. Thank you very much.